Everyone knows how the Greeks laid siege for ten long years to the city of Troy to win back Helen, the most beautiful woman in the world, for her husband, the king of Sparta. It was Paris, a son of the old Trojan king, who stole her away from home, and because of her beauty, neither king nor folk would heed the warnings of the seers and wise men that the wrath of the gods would fall on Troy unless they gave up Helen. Year after year the war went on, the flower of both armies fell in battle, the losses and hardships of the besieged grew ever greater, but still they would not hear of giving Helen back. Even those who were ready to curse her forgot all the woes she had brought on Troy whenever they looked on her face. Once the elders of the city, grave and ancient men, were sitting together on the ramparts when Helen passed by, and one said to another, Small blame to the Greeks and Trojans that they have fought and suffered those many years for the sake of such a woman as this, for she is like an immortal goddess to look upon. So great was the power of Helen's beauty on all who beheld it. In the tenth year, Troy fell, the Greeks sacked and burned the city, and put every male to the sword, sparing neither old men nor infants in a lust for revenge. The aged king himself was slain at his household altar. But now the divine wrath was turned from the vanquished to the victors, for the gods, to whom vengeance belongs, hate all such as exact it beyond due measure. Therefore, when the Greeks sailed for home, a fearful tempest arose, which wrecked some of their ships and scattered the rest far and wide over the deep, so that they lost their course and only reached port after long toil and peril. Moreover, there were few of their kings and captains who did not find disaster waiting for them when they came home at last. But there was one chief who had shed no blood save in fight, nor plundered any temple, and had refused any share in the spoil. This was Tusser, son of Telamon, and brother to that Ajax who was the strongest and bravest of all the Greeks, except divine Achilles. Now after Achilles was slain, his heavenly armor was to be awarded by vote to the next best warrior in the host, but Odysseus by cunning wiles prevailed on the Greeks to award him the prize of honor, and this unjust disgrace so disordered the mind of Ajax that he died by his own sword. And Tusser, though he fought until Troy was taken, being under oath so to do, would have no share in the victory of those who had so wronged his beloved brother, he set sail before any of them, and the gods gave him swift and safe passage to his home in the island called Salamis. But when old Telamon heard that his favorite son, Ajax, was dead, he was filled with rage against Tusser and reviled him as a coward and traitor for not having saved his brother or else died in his defense. Nor would he listen to another word of Tusser's story, but fiercely bade him get to sea again, for he should never set foot in Salamis while he, Telamon, lived. Then sadly the young man turned to his followers, bold seamen all, and asked them to do him the last service of rowing him over to the near mainland. But there was no chief in the Greek host more loved by his men for courage and kindness than he, and they all cried out, Let us go with Tusser, comrades. Shame us if we desert him. Up sail and to sea, Tusser shall be our captain and lead us to a new home. And seeing they would take no denial, Tusser thanked them from a full heart, and when they had revittled the ship they set out on their voyage of adventure. Not knowing in what part of the wide world to seek his fortune, Tusser resolved to ask counsel of Apollo's famous oracle at Delphi. So he sailed first to the port of Syrah, whence he traveled on foot to the high mountain glen of Delphi and entered the holy temple. When he had duly sacrificed, he made known his request, and the priestess, speaking by inspiration of Apollo, bade him found a city in the far island of Cyprus and name it Salamis after his old home. There, she said, he should dwell prosperously all his days and see his children's children, who should reign as kings after him. Many weeks did Tusser sail the Midland Sea on that quest, and touched at many an island, but none of them proved to be Cyprus. At last, the wanderer sighted at dawn the white gleaming cliffs of a small isle and a long coastline behind it, misty and low-lying. So much as they could see of the isle appeared desert, but as they needed fresh water they put into a cove among the cliffs where a brook ran down to the sea. And while the crews were filling the water skins and cooking a meal on the beach, Tusser went to see if any folk dwelt inland, from whom he might ask his bearings. A path led up from the cove to the top of the isle, which was flat as a table, partly wooded and partly open down. No sign of habitation could Tusser spy until he had crossed this plateau and looked down on the landward shore. But there, to his wonder, stood a great mansion of dark red stone, with courts and colonnades, built so massively that it seemed the work of giants. The face of the cliff above it was cut into terraces which were ablaze with strange flowers, and a broad stairway wound from terrace to terrace. 
Down this he hastened well pleased, trusting to find hospitality in so stately a house and learn his course for Cyprus. Then he saw that the front of the house was a blank wall, with no openings but a central doorway of great height, and the carved bronze doors were shut. This looked unpromising. He began to wonder if the place was a temple or a fortress, though what either could be doing in this apparently desert isle he could not imagine. And then he saw on his left a small chapel of black marble, and a low, flat-topped tomb of the same stone in front of it, and beside the tomb stood a woman very richly dressed and adorned. Lady, said Tusser, of your courtesy tell me the name of this place and who is lord of so royal a dwelling. But scarce had he spoken this when, looking at her more narrowly, gods above, he cried, What do I see? Are you, can you be, Helen? Nay, nay, he muttered, I must be dreaming. How could the accursed wretch come here? And yet, so like, so like. Now by my brother's soul, if it is Helen, I will kill her on the spot. And his hand moved to his sword hilt. But the lady looked him full in the face, drawing herself up with the air of an insulted queen. Stranger, she said, haughtily, I know not of whom you speak, and I desire I may hear no more of such language. Your pardon, lady, said Tusser, abashed by her look and manner, I took you for one whom every Greek holds in utter loathing, a golden-haired fiend for whose wicked sake hundreds of brave men have fallen and hundreds of homes been made desolate. I was wrong, of course, but you would forgive me if you knew what an extraordinary resemblance. Say no more of that, said the lady, hastily, but tell me who you are, and what brings you here. Then Tusser told her his name and story, and when he spoke of Troy she said, I have heard how the Greeks laid siege to that city to win back his wife for King Menelaus. Some say it will never be taken, so long and gallantly have the Trojans defended it. They say false, then, said Tusser, it was taken the night before I sailed thence, and burned to the ground, for we had sworn not to leave one stone upon another. Troy is taken, exclaimed the lady. Then Menelaus knows. I mean, surely you heard, what befell his wife? Nay, I saw it with my own eyes, replied Tusser. Menelaus, the fawn fool, would not kill her, for all our urging him to do justice on the adulteress, but took her on board his ship and made as much of her as ever. And if they weathered the great storm coming home, by this time she is once more queening it in Sparta. She, gasped the lady. But, but, this false Helen. Well may you say false, said Tusser, but when you say Helen, you give her a worse name still, I, one that shall stand for infamy to the world's end. But what ails you, noble dame? You look of a sudden as white as death. It will pass, she answered, faintly, your story has brought back my own misfortunes, that is all. I, too, have known exile and loss of loved ones. Tears brimmed her great gray eyes as she spoke, and she looked at the young man with a wistful smile that went straight to his heart. If I could serve you in any way, he began. Ah, but you cannot, she cried. You must leave me instantly, selfish that I am, I was forgetting the danger you were in. Know that the land you see yonder is Egypt, and this is the summer palace of the king, who has such a mortal hatred of your race that he puts to death every Greek that sets foot in his country. He has gone hunting this morning, but any moment some of his people may spy you from the house. Go, go quickly, I entreat you, and take heed you do not fall in with him on your way. Hasten aboard your ship and may the gods bring you to your desired haven. Farewell, farewell. And before Tusser could utter a word, she had disappeared into the chapel. He saw nothing for it but to do as she had bidden him. That was a strange encounter, he thought, as he cautiously retraced his steps across the aisle, and why that noble and virtuous lady, for such I dare swear she is, should be the living image of the vile traitress Helen, is a mystery the gods alone can unriddle. But one thing is clear, this isle is a good place to be leaving. And here our story bids farewell to the good Tusser. Yet it may be told that when he had safely rejoined his comrades, they sailed with a fair wind to a spacious island haven, where Phoenician merchant ships were lying at anchor, and learned from the dark-skinned crews that this was Cyprus at last. There the exiles built a new Salamis and took wives from among the island folk, 
Their colony flourished according to Apollo's promise, and the descendants of Tusser reigned as kings of Cyprus for many generations. 